Like Lauri mentioned, I study computer graphics. And it's a field of computer science that had, had humble beginnings. But for several decades already, it's, even though it looked, didn't look that great in the beginning, it's captured people's imaginations and, and you know, taken us to strange new places and, and really thrilled us with uh, um, given us really cherished experiences. It's keeping us entertained today. Uh, if you look at uh, a movie like, say, the Lord of the Rings films, everything you see on the screen pretty much is, is generated by graphics, as is, uh, as is exemplified here in this breakdown shot from Weta Digital. Even more mundane looking things like, you know, you see a TV series set in New York, often it's shot in, in a studio and, and filled in with uh, plates, background plates, so you don't have to go out on location. Of course, entertainment is just one uh, application of computer graphics. Things started really pushing forward in the 60s when the military in the US decided that we need to build simulators that allow our, our pilots to train uh, without actually flying planes. Um, graphics and, uh, and scientific visualization are, are tightly coupled. Uh, for instance, here we uh, can get a glimpse into a very fragile, uh, precious uh, artifact, a mummy, through a CT scan and computer graphics visualization of, of the contents. Of course, architectural visualization, when you, you, you can model buildings and, and draw pictures of them that appear as if you'd build it, even though you haven't. And it's becoming really, really hard to distinguish these from, from actual photographs. But it, it is actually synthetic, like is this picture and that picture. Although the applications of graphics have so far been concentrated on, on our screens, like our TV screens and computer screens and so forth, with the recent advent of virtual reality, consumer virtual reality headsets, it's becoming or taking a leap outside of our screens and, and more into, the, into you know, full, full views of the world. And in particular, our, uh, augmented reality, which is a branch of graphics and vision that overlays graphical elements on top of our view of the real world, uh, graphical techniques are, are really going to affect all of our lives in, in an even bigger way tomorrow. Okay, so what do you need to do to draw on a computer satisfyingly complex pictures of the real world? The real world is complex. The shapes of objects in the real world are complex. Um, the, the interaction of light and, and these shapes is complex. That is to say, the materials in our objects uh, act on light in, in, in complex ways. And the objects, you know, what we actually see of that world um, <clears throat> is also complex. We, when we draw a picture, we have to account for complex visibility effects between our, our objects and, and our virtual camera. So how do we actually do this? Well, first, uh, in order to draw, uh, draw a synthetic picture, we have to specify what's in the world. We have to model it and say what shape it is and, you know, roughly what color it is. I'll come back to that later. And because static scenes are not super interesting, we also need to animate that scene, either by hand or by capturing movements uh, from real actors or, uh, or by physical simulation. But because in the end we're interested in pictures, the final step in after all of this is that when we want to draw the picture, and that boils down simply to figuring out what's visible in your picture, computing what's visible, and then computing what color those things are that, that are visible in the picture. This really eloquent description of the rendering problem is due to my, my, my friend and now Berkeley professor, Jonathan Reagan Kelly but it's, uh, it's really not that more complicated. So images are formed by interaction of light and matter. If there was no light, you know, we wouldn't see anything. So in, in a very deep level, image synthesis or realistic image synthesis is about uh, radiation transport problem. We have to figure out how light energy or right, light radiation, after it leaves the sources, we, we have to account for all the infinitely many and infinitely complex ways it can uh, interact with the scene before hitting our virtual sensor. And so how we model this, this is the only equation I'm going to show in this talk. Um, we model this radiation transport as an integral differential equation that, that describes how the flow of, of, of light energy uh, happens in the scene, accounting for scattering events like with smoke and, and so forth. It turns out, though, that when you, when you think about it really hard, the solutions to this equation can be written down as integrals, really, really high dimensional and nasty integrals. But it still boils down to uh, integrating, integrating functions. And this we do with Monte Carlo methods, statistical methods. So we basically throw darts and, and pick random light paths and do this enough many times, and then we get good looking results like that. If we don't put in enough effort and you know, use a shorter time, then we get pictures that are ne not necessarily that usable. And so this is placed to the same theme that Petri says, how we actually do this 
to use our computational resources efficiently is, is a part of the algorithm design here. So why is this hard? This is a, this is a picture of standard office environment. Uh, nothing too complicated there. But if you consider that the, that the building may be situated in a model of a city, you know, it's, it's one, one small part, uh, part in the city, and you, know, you get sunlight illuminating the, illuminating the sky. The issue is that if you consider all the possible paths light can take in this environment, only a really, really vanishingly small subset of them actually contributes to the image. Um, and, and so in, in a very real sense, when we perform this, uh, this integration, we have to find computational ways that allow our light and our camera to connect. And this can be a really, really difficult problem in, uh, in complicated scenes. In fact, it is so difficult that despite, despite decades of work, no efficient, robust, output-sensitive algorithms exist for this problem. Output-sensitive means that um, uh, the, the complexity of your output image should be the deciding factor in, in the time it takes to render that picture, and not, not the things that you don't actually see. But this, this is something we cannot do, and we've, we've worked, we're working towards it, but it's, it's a tall order. So, what can we do about this? We can build samplers that, that draw better light paths, uh, and that's, that's, uh, that's been worked on for, for decades, and we we're also doing work on that, but I won't talk about it today. Uh, a second avenue is use your sampler and use the samples that you got uh, better. And one example of, um, of, of this is a fundamentally novel kind of uh, image synthesis algorithm that we published in 2013. Whereas a standard Monte Carlo algorithm in a, in a given amount of time would maybe result in a, in a noisy image. It estimates all the values, the brightnesses of the pixels separately. What we do is instead of estimating the, the brightnesses of the pixels separately, in addition, we estimate how the brightness changes from one pixel to the next. It's almost the same computation, almost, almost as, cheap, as cheap but we, we use a Monte Carlo estimator to, to figure out this, this so-called finite difference uh, gradient of the image contribution. Then we can basically integrate this gradient. We know integrals and, and derivatives go, you know, they go in opposite directions, and combine that with the with actual image, um, the integrated result and the, and the previous estimate to get an image that actually looks a lot better than, uh, than the coarse standard algorithm result that we, that we see on the left. And this is almost for the same computational cost, um, uh, the, the result on the, on the right. So this result is, is really highly surprising. Um, it turns out that estimating uh, the finite difference image gradients and then integrating those gradients yields far superior performance per unit of time when, when you run, run, this, run this algorithm excuse me, or when you compare it to standard algorithms. And it still shares all the nice properties of the original algorithms. It's consistent, meaning you get the right answer in the limit and so forth. And so it is really a fundamentally new way of, of rendering realistic pictures. So I want to use, use a few words to, to talk about the nature of this, this, uh, this discovery. Uh, we, I, I had the idea in the summer of 2012. It was first, first very fuzzy. We got some initial encouraging results. I worked with uh, a group of incredibly smart people and pushed really hard, and we could make it, in, uh, make it work in the so-called Markov chain Monte Carlo context, or MCMC context. It doesn't matter what that means. Uh, the key thing is that it's, it's extremely hard to get right in a, in a light transport context. So it was totally impractical, not usable in, 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 in production or, or, or practice, but the idea worked. Then later, two years later, we realized that the same idea that's behind this um, this, this uh, computation of the derivative can also be applied in the much, much simpler context of uh, regular Monte Carlo estimates. And all of a sudden, we have a practical algorithm that's five to 10 times faster than, than, the, than the things that people are actually using in the industry. And all of a sudden, there's big industri industrial in, uh, interest in all of this. And in fact, Markus Kettunen, one of my PhD students, spent the spring at Weta Digital, the foremost visual effects company in the world, implementing this in their production pipeline. So I would say this is an example of, a, a good example for the value of fundamental research. We could not have gone from the, the, the state we were at in 2012 directly to the usable algorithm. We had to make a leap forward through this hard case and then bring it back down towards practice. 
And, uh, and this is something that we would not have been able to do without the freedom of, of doing basic research. Uh, okay. So that's, that's what I have to say about image synthesis. Um, there's other complexity involved than rendering. In particular, when, when we look at the surfaces around us in the real world, uh, the appearance of, uh, of many, many things are, are characterized by, by really small scale variations in, in bumpiness and shininess and color. Like so if we look at, look at pictures of these surfaces, it's really the changes in like how, they, how they reflect light in various different points that gives them their character. And we have to replicate this in, in, our, in our virtual environment to, to make compelling looking pictures. How we model this in graphics is we, we consider an incident tiny beam of illumination and then we look at how when it reflects off a surface like what is the shape of reflection as it, as it spreads around from that, that surface. For instance a mirror only reflects to one direction and, and so forth. And we, we uh, model this using so-called bidirectional reflectance distribution functions. Uh, and we have a bunch of parametric models that have a number of knobs that we can tweak to basically set the shape of that reflectance function. So this is for a single <coughs> surface point. Now, when we make these reflectance parameters change over, over different points in space, that is to say we change the color, we change how shiny it is, how much shininess there is, and where the surface uh, points uh, locally, and do this in a really, really careful manner, uh, we can actually get uh, synth uh, we, can, we can build models of, of surface appearance that you cannot really distinguish from, from the real world. So on the left you see a photograph of a real surface um, lit by an area light source and on the right there's a synthetic reproduction of that same scenario that, but we could do the same thing anywhere in any lighting condition. We could put these on any object uh, we, we like. And this is captured using a system that we, that we built with Mika Aittala uh, a couple years ago. So the geometry is just two triangles, and, and the rest is just about how light reflects off of these, these other points. Um, how this is done in practice these days in production is mostly manual and very time consuming. So this sort of capture from the real world is, is really desirable to, to use less time for things. But traditional capture devices have been a little cumbersome, so you can't you know, carry this thing around. So what we do instead is we take this down to a cell phone and concentrate to textured materials, which is something, uh, which are materials where there's something repeating over that surface. And if we look at this flash photo of a, of a leather, we notice that we see sort of the same stuff in different parts of the picture that are lit from different angles, right? And this is exactly the thing that we can then build a fancy computation out of and uh, exploit this redundancy to, to build up this parametric model. Here's an example of our latest algorithm published at SIGGRAPH this year uh, where we, our optimizer starts from a coarse initial guess. It's, uh, it, it tries to find the model parameters that uh, explain the observed behavior in, under different lighting conditions. And the optimizer, you can see it tuning these parameters such that when, when it's going further, the results blend in better and better with, uh, with the background photo, so that in the end you can't really distinguish what's, what's, what's the photo and what's, uh, what's not. And now, even though we originally had just one single picture with a static flash, now we can take this material and start you know, lighting and, and drawing it in any, any lighting condition that we like, and you know, put, ver put this material on our virtual objects and, uh, and light it whatever way we want. So this is an unprecedented result in, in graphics and vision. It's, uh, it's brought on by uh, a novel kind of combination of traditional forward uh, rendering algorithms or image synthesis algorithms with learned error metrics from, uh, from, uh, lifted from uh, image recognition through deep learning and all combined together and through mathematical optimization into a big nonlinear inverse problem. This is Mika Aittala's PhD work, by the way, he's defending in uh, slightly more than two weeks. So this is today useful in the industry. Uh, it's being productized on auto slices in the industry right now. But again, we did not think about solving a practical problem when we worked on this research. It's again an example of something that, okay, how can we do this with the least amount of data that we possibly can? Let's really, you know, try hard and solve this problem. Then it just turns out that, yeah, if you, you know, tweak it a little further, something actually useful can come out. Uh, what's, what I'm even more excited about, though, is that I believe this work has the potential to open up really, really new avenues in, in computer vision. Computer vision is uh, the, the field that tries to 
you know, looking at pictures tries to infer stuff about the uh, structure of the real world. Now we have the ability to, to scan lots and lots of materials from the real world. We can imagine building a huge database of materials, allowing the computer to generate hypotheses uh, and, and test them all by itself when it's trying to figure out you know, what the 3D structure of the world is. So funny enough, uh, for current computer vision algorithms, uh, this is a problem. You know, it's a picture of my hardwood floor. If you look at this dent over here, it's, the middle, it's in the middle of a specular highlight. Now if I move the camera a little bit, the same dent is over here. You and I can tell. But funny enough, current computer vision algorithms have a really hard time telling that these two are actually the same point, and then they cannot reliably reason about the three-dimensional structure of the world based on, because of this difficulty. So I believe that this, this combination of image synthesis and computer vision in a, in a tight loop that we've demonstrated here for the first time, uh, this fusion of, of, of that graphics and vision has the potential to open up really, really exciting new doors. In fact, you know, if you think about what happens if you let robots loose in a, dom a domestic environment, for instance, they have to be able to react and, and recognize materials they haven't seen before. And, uh, uh, and, and I believe we can build algorithms based on this combination that will enable them to reason about their surroundings much better. Okay, I want to conclude by, uh, by thanking a couple of people. I haven't seen notes from you. Okay, thank you. Um, so first of all, the story how I got my PhD is, uh, is a strange one. Come ask me about it on the reception. I don't have time to talk about it now. But I do want to talk, uh, thank my, my PhD student colleagues, Timo Samuli and Janne, Janne Kontkonen, who's now with Google, for the decades of work we've done together. How we learned to do stuff together. I chose this path in the, uh, in the academia, but any one of us could be standing here. And, and, and I'm really, really grateful for your continued collaboration and, and friendship and, and all the work. Thanks, thank, thank you a lot. I want to also thank, greatly thank my P, uh, postdoc advisor, Fre Professor Freda Durand of MIT. The two and a half years I spent there, you know, forever changed my view of, of university life. And, uh, and you know, his, um, you know, how, how things, uh, how you should do research, basically. He's an incredibly warm and smart and positive uh, and, and friendly person, uh, incredibly smart doesn't stress, a, a total role model for, for all academicians, really. Um, I want to thank my PhD students, uh, Mika, Markus, and Ari, who, who are actually doing the frontline work in, in, in all of this uh, these days. It's, it's really a collaborative effort. I'm really picky in hiring. I'm really happy I've hired you. I'm super, super excited about the work that we, that we do together and, and continue, continue to do. Uh, lastly, I want to thank Lauri Savioja, my former supervisor and, uh, and current department head, because Lauri had an instrumental hand in the strange situation that led us to, to being able to complete our PhDs in the first place. Lauri is, uh, is an incredible person. He's altruistic, uh, friendly, always has time, creates an atmosphere of, of openness and uh, comfort, uh, and, and just radiates out this, this goodness. Uh, he's, a, he's a great human being. Thank you, Lauri. <laughs> and not, I'm not saying this because he's, he's my department head. <laughs> he has no money to give me. <laughs> uh, lastly, I want to thank all of my co-authors over the years, um, including the super, super inspiring students, uh, the undergrads that I get to teach at Aalto. Um, I try and, you know, push you to do things, and boy, do you do it. It's, it's so incredibly inspiring to see you, you, you run with it. And uh, lastly, I want to thank Salla, who may be watching this from across the ocean, for making my life so much more happy. Thank you. <laughs>